Just to let you know, Dave Caldwell, that these allegations are not going to go away. This is just the beginning. So I think you need to come out and do an interview. I mean, any other time, we can't get you off IFL, behind the gloves, seconds out, boxing, social, fight, hype. We can't get you off YouTube. So you need to come out and answer these allegations. You're more than welcome to come on Porky's Corner. You can do it by Zoom. You don't have to do it in your gym. You can do it by Zoom, and I'll ask you these questions from these lads, all right? And then once you've answered them, then I'm going to play a card that I've got up my sleeve and put this to bed, all right? So come out, come out, wherever you are. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Russ here from Porky's Corner. Today we're joined by Rico, my good friend from London, who has founded Channel with me. How are you doing, Rico? Good, thank you. And most importantly, happy to see that you're doing better than you were a few weeks ago and looking like a crew, looking like a lightweight these days. But yeah, it's uh, it's been a stressful time to make sure that you're doing well. So it's so happy to be doing this today. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm getting a bit of weight and I think I'm about 158 this morning. About 153, one out at one point. <laughs> you know what? Um, give me a few weeks and you'll be in the ring with Sonny Edwards. I know, yeah. <laughs> Frightening experience that'll be, ain't it? I mean, he's a roadman killer, isn't he, Stuart Little? I mean, he's got two dogs in his photo, which he's holding, so he's a scary guy, isn't he? Real scary dude. Uh, a lot's gone on, Rico, in boxing, but first off, I want to talk about Dazone, BT Sport and Bricktop coming out, uh, sort of defending his corner, saying, look, Matt, I've got a contract, I've got a concrete contract, anybody will mess with it, the legal implications. Why do you think he's come out talking like that? I think it's just to make sure that his stable doesn't feel like they're under threat or there's going to be changes, right? Because those are, if people are worried about BT Sports and don't want to work with Eddie, so I can see people jumping ship. So he needs to say whether he can to not rock the boat within the fighters he has in his stable. And he's a bit, uh, it's a bit bare, isn't it, at the moment, Frank's stable, isn't it? Yeah. Look, it's got young, talented fighters, but the problem is at the top, there's nobody to anchor the shows. So yeah. why would I tune in to watch? I mean, Yard against Arthur's a good fight, but aside from that, why would I tune in to watch any of his shows? Because at the top, there's no good fights. Well, there's good fighters, but not top-level fights. I mean, match room's pretty terrible as well, but say what you want to say, there's at least there's interesting names and potentially interesting fights to be made uh, against foreign fighters, whereas Brick Top's guys are predominantly English and British level and some European level fighters. What do you think to Brick Top sort of getting fighters into position and into mandatories with WBO? He's done it with Parker. He's done it with uh, Joe Joyce and um, uh, Debar with WBA. Do you think that that's public way forward for him to make some ground up and think down the line. Yeah, probably. But also that's a cheap way to manage your budget, isn't it? Because you go to purse buds, you offer what you can and you hope your fighters get good off and they might go on another platform. Essentially, he's become a small hall plus promoter, in my opinion. So he does everything that Dennis used to do years ago and, you know, all these guys, whether that be Mick Hennessy years ago and others, where you sort of below that upper echelons of the top promoters in terms of what you can do. And if he had the money, he'd probably want to be pressing those issues and try and win those purse bids and making offers. But with mandatories, the fighters just buy their time and he can put them in positions where they'll get paid they whatever it is, 25 or 30%, depending on the sanctioning body. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. Do you feel that boxing is going through a, one of the most important next six-month periods that it's ever going to go through in the last 30 years? Yeah, I, I'd agree. I mean, look, it's becoming more and more of a fringe sport. Uh, it's very fragmented. So you've got boxer, you've got 
uh, BT Sports, you've got The Zone, um, you've got Hennessy and everybody else on TV. Um, so I, I just don't think there's enough talent. And I think a lot will hinge on whether whether the amateurs turn over and whether they can generate enough excitement because the last class of British amateurs, I think, fell flat on his face. So actually getting people excited about the sport again, and I think Terry's mentioned this in his podcast, now that we've come out of this lockdown a while ago, we've done everything we wanted in the summer, boxing's been competing for our time and it's not top of most people's priority list. If you're going to see a mate after many months or you're going to go and watch uh, the cards that have been on telly over the last few months, I think most people would be happy to see their mate rather. Yeah, do you feel that Frank and Eddie have got to take some criticism as regards why we've not really had the fights in, in, in the last few years and that you think they've got to take it on chin and have a look at themselves maybe the ego is going away yeah 100 percent. i mean the less there's not enough good fighters to be as fragmented as it is so people need to work together and also a lot of the fights that we were talking about two years ago that we wanted to see and you know were interested in making they aren't they haven't happened so that's all fed into that's all fed into a decline of boxing. And I think the pandemic was a big missed opportunity. I know you couldn't sell tickets, but, you know, every other sports more or less tried to step up in the best way they could, you know, football end up in three o'clock kickoffs on sky sports and, you know, boxing could have done a lot more to get people more attracted to the sports. Look at what UFC did. I mean, UFC gained massive, gained massive grounds, uh, during the pandemic, whereas boxing sat on his laurels and made even worse fights. And that was when everybody had time on their hands and were willing to be excited about something. And that just never came to fruition. They never even met on Zoom, did they, her and all one and all spoke on phone. It was just it was just lip service to fans 20 months ago and then nothing won it. Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think Al Heyman and Bob Arum have ever met, but they could still work together and they have worked together. So you can put your people to meet uh, the other team's people and, you know, you can still make fights. You don't have to be best mates with somebody, but, you know, everybody makes more money when the pie becomes bigger and the interest grows and everybody gets paid. It's no case that by helping somebody else in boxing into zero-sum game. Do you think that might be why Joshua might be thinking, hang on a minute, I've not fought Wilder, I've not fought Ortiz, and I've not fought uh, Tyson Fury, the three big rivals to Anthony Joshua in the last five years. We both agree, don't we, on that? Mm -hmm. He's never fought them. Is that because he's a coward, or is it because people find it hard to work with Eddie Earth? Uh, I, I don't go around calling boxers cowards, and I think... Generally, Joshua would fight against everyone, but it's probably Eddie Hearn more so. If Wilder and Fury can make three fights between them across two US networks and across two promotional outfits that are massive rivals in the same markets, there's nothing to say that Joshua couldn't fight against Fury. I think it's all, I think it's more Eddie Hearn. And it's more also ceding control because the moment you start ceding control to of Joshua to somebody else and, you know, helping them with their destiny, he's worried about, you know, having other people in Joshua's ear and other promoters would be in Joshua's ear if they were working together and, you know, things would be done in a different way and Joshua might get some ideas. The grass might be green on the other side. What will be the implications for... Eddie Earn and Joshua, if Usek beats him in rematch, we go comfortably. I, you know what, with Joshua, I think it's back to the drawing board. You have to make a decision on whether you want to go another route to try and win a title or whether you want to, I don't know what you want to do. I mean, it's up to him. I don't think fighters losing isn't the end of the world. And I think also, but for Matchroom, it means that they biggest attraction and they negotiating power and leverage across the zone and sky sports and everybody else who they work with just goes out the window. I mean, a lot of matchroom revenues are tied to these Joshua shows and also a lot of their power. If, if matchroom didn't have Joshua, do you think the zone would care about them that much? No, 
So for Matroom, it's bigger than it is for Joshua. Joshua is just a single fighter, but Matroom have put all of their eggs in one basket when it comes to Joshua. So for them, um, who are they going to push? Conor Ben? Callum oh. Smith? Conor Ben's yeah. been up with half a million to fight even Ishin on BT. Well, that's it. I mean, look, they, there's not anybody they can push at the same level and generate the same interest in ticket sales. So for Matchroom, it's a big, big, I wouldn't say gamble, but, you know, it's quite, it's quite a big issue for them if Joshua doesn't win because who do they then have as world champions and star attractions? I mean, anybody is a really who's the, the, the other world champion, Bivol. Yeah, but let's think about British terms. Well, that's is not even a world champion, is he? No. Um, let's see. I mean, look, if you think about Josh Taylor, he's with Sky. Um, Billy Joe Saunders is more or less done now. Um, Lawrence Acoli, but who's not that interesting. Josh Warrington has lost his title. Kid Galahad isn't really a big attraction. So we've got um, Galahad and Acoli. Which you want, yeah. open, you want open curtains to watch them, would you? No. I mean, and BT have, well, BT have Fury. Fury. Sky have Josh Taylor. Eddie's got, who's uh, Eddie got? Shannon Courtney's not got a belt. Katie Taylor, yeah. a Coley, Galahad, Bivol. He's a foreigner though, isn't he? Yeah, and he's not, you know, he's not really a name, is he? Mm. The man on the street doesn't know who Bevel is. Let's have a look now. Just a second. Let's see who matter. They've got Dillian White. He's who's not no world champion. European, has he? Yet? Yeah. Sky have Chris Eubank Jr. as well. Gimmick. Yeah, but he's still an attraction, right? We can build a show around him. Yeah, as a I mean, who the question is more for me, who can he build a show around? He can probably build you can build a show around Dillian White. People will be interested. You could still build a show around Joshua, but neither of these are like big, big attractions in their own right. Lawrence Sicoli, you don't really want to be building a show around him. You can probably do that, but uh, Liam Smith. Three old pussy in a split. Yeah, Liam Smith, <laughs> Callum Smith. Uh, Liam yeah, Smith, it's... Liam Smith's seen better days, hasn't he? Uh, if you look at Box Rec. If yeah. you look at BoxRec top 25 in the UK, the matchroom fighters are Buatzi, Corner Ben, Josh Warrington, Lee Wood, John Ryder, Liam Smith, Chizora, Galahad, Dylan White, Dylan White, Joshua, Saunders. None of those are big attractions. It's hard to fill a O2 were any of those guys apart from the heavyweights ready. Only Lawrence that's got a belt out that lot, isn't it? Yep. So basically, there's a there's a story behind all of them. They might do numbers on IFL, but none of them's got any hardware, have they? But the only one of the top 25 fighters, or the only people according to BoxRec, top 25, so I don't subscribe that this is necessarily top 25. The only one, the only ones under 26 or under of the top 25 British fighters are Sonny Edwards, who's a flyweight, so no one's interested. Uh, Connor Ben, who's an attraction, but it's hard to see him going all the way. So, who else? Everybody else up over 20, 26. So people are not taking that people are not coming through and being successful in the sport, are they? No, even if you think about top names, Tyson Fury, Joshua, Callum Smith, Josh Taylor, Dillian White, Chris Eubank Jr., you know, Billy Joe Saunders, Kelbrook. Hashtag game changed. Kid Galahad, all of them are 30 or over. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. So next generation of people are watching, like I said, aren't they? Watching the UFC. Well, exactly. And for good reason. I mean, I'm not a UFC fan, but, you know, they make 
good fights and there's always big events every weekend. I don't know who the names are, but there was one this weekend. Uh, there's always good storylines. There's always new talent coming through. So, you know, the UFC has a great model, but that model works when you have a monopoly in, it, in essence. So who's to blame then, Rico, from us hitting this high? Uh, Vladimir versus Joshua, even though Vladimir were 42 and it were life and death and Fury took him to school 18 months before he'd been laid on couch 18 months. So who's to blame from that? Is it because Wilder didn't fight the winner, they went another route? Or is it because fans have just lost interest and with the Eddie Hearn bullshit? What can fans get excited about? I mean, Eddie Hearn's invested in signing guys that are amateurs and they haven't worked out, but, you know, they're not scouting the best talent in the country. They're not, they're not matching them properly that we can get interested and they lose before they get to the stage that we should get interested. So I think it's a combination of things. It's poor matchmaking and too safe matchmaking. I don't need to see Campbell Hassan getting gift wins. And then it's also just the lack of scouting of the talent, right? You can't, there's a lot of kids in this country that are talented kids that if they were given the right opportunities, they probably would have done better than a lot of the people on the matchroom roster. Do you feel, Rico, the bring digging up Lucas Browns, Eric Molinas and people like that, where they keep going back to the same people to put them in with these matchroom next-gen guys? Do you feel that, it's become a tired old format and it needs freshening up. Yeah, hundred percent. I'd rather see people like Fabian Wardley in good fights, competitive fights, and then I would know what level they are because I'm not convinced any of these guys are at the level where I can get excited about them. You look at someone like Virgil Ortiz or Jerome Boots Ennis or you know these guys that have in the US the, the next generation. They fought very credible opponents early on in their career. They don't get to 25 fights and they're fighting against tomato cans. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And like I said to you earlier, do you feel that Eamon is going to keep Canelo away from Eddie now, keep, keep him sweet? Well, I think Eddie Reynoso said that uh, they met with Heyman they had a really good conversation and they have found working with him brilliant. And it's, um, you know, they want to keep working with him and Heyman can offer the money. He can also put him on Showtime where he gets real fans watching it, you know, real exposure, which he can't get on the zone. Um, I think that it's a no brainer really, right? He can fight against Charlo next and the U S fans are interested. Who does Eddie have to offer him? Danny Jacobs again. Yeah. Well, this is it. I mean, the zone is a fringe ball platform, right? It's a platform that nobody outside of boxing knows in the UK or US, and nobody subscribes to you outside of those. You don't get your sponsors to, you know, they not. If you, let's say you porky enterprises and you want to sponsor a fighter, who would you rather see them? Oh, I fight at Sky Sports, so I fight at the zone. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, you'd obviously want them on Sky Sports, right? It's a obviously, bigger thing for yeah, a brand. Yeah. So this is where the zone falls flat. There's not enough subscribers and it's not a big enough platform that you can attract money by fighting on it. Aren't they going back to pay-per-view? Yeah, it seems like the zone are going to pay-per-view, which is against everything they railed against because pay-per-view was meant to be dead. Didn't Teddy tell us the pay-per-view was dead while he was pushing pay-per-view in this country and now he's saying that he can't make fights like Dillian White against uh, Ruiz. Andy Ruiz unless it's pay-per-view. Do you think Eddie will just... Well, do you think he's shut his mouth off? He's dug his scent in a bit of an owl because now he's going to have to come back and say, well, yesterday I were lying, today I'm telling the truth. While he's got his contingency of fans that protect him and uh, believe everything he says so and also it's not like IFL and others are going to be asking him the real questions when it comes to this stuff because you know he's got soft interviews remember when he went to the US and he was interviewed there he got ripped to shreds Bad and he didn't like it about him, didn't he? 
Yeah, he didn't like it, did he? No, no. Remember when uh, he went on the Boxing Voice and um, Nesta Gibbs' show and he was talking about Joshua and Wilder and then Nesta Gibbs rang up Shelley Finkel on there and Shelley Finkel and him had his house and Eddie, Eddie seemed like he was lying the whole time, right? Yeah, he's in a he's in a bit of a pickle now because he's he's tried that uh, apples and pears carry on over there, but the, the, it's a different sport to over here, isn't it? You know, Eddie, Eddie got lucky with Carl Frotch over here and Kel Brook, didn't he? And a couple bar mm-hmm. of people, and he sort of got a bit of momentum, and then Joshua got gifted a, a gold medal, and then it just sort of snowballed, didn't it? But he's tried that over there and they've gone no 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 we're not having it and i think he's in a bit of a bit of a, a pickle well the reality is a lot of the american fighters and people in boxing don't want a british guy coming over there telling them how it's done and telling them how badly they've been doing their jobs i think it's quite disrespectful and in eddie's case it's a bit naive to think that just by having stadiums full and singing sweet carolina people are, that's boxing game changed it's something from the you know it's this football fan mentality which frank warren used to push in boxing so that's why Eddie's essentially doing that listen mate you know them yanks over there what their problem is they're sitting down with a big tray popcorn burgers hot dogs and that where the british are sitting down with trays of, of, of offmeister and stella and they want to let rip whereas them they're like they're falling to sleep because they've had too much to eat yeah, what I love it. So, do you think? Yeah, but look, it's a different boxing market. Uh, boxing's boxing's not as big as a sports. Day. I mean, boxing comes there after NFL, NBA, NHL, NASCAR, MLB. It's probably the sixth or seventh UFC. It's the seventh biggest sport at a minimum. Sorry, at a maximum. And all followed by a KFC. Yeah, <laughs> but you have to know the market and, you know, him coming there, criticising Stephen Espinosa and saying how bad they've been running boxing for years and how he'll change everything. It's not exactly, it's not going to work, is it? No, it ain't going to work. And do you know what? Eddie's had that many goes at Stephen Espinosa now that they've all pulled rank, haven't they, on him and sort of close him down and they shut him out. Well, he can't make fights if he doesn't have the fighters and also if he doesn't have the other networks cooperating. I mean, Steven Espinosa, yet again in the front row for the Canelo fight, sitting there. He's made another great fight. Canelo planned last night, well, last night, this early morning. So it's not like Steven Espinosa doesn't know what he's doing. It's more Eddie Hearn doesn't know what he's doing. What's that? Taking Bob's... Pardon? What's Eddie done this year? I'm not sure, but I find it quite funny that he's there at the Canelo uh, show trying to be like he's, well, you know, still he, involved. Did he go to Canelo plant fight last night, Eddie? Mm, let me see. I, d- I just saw him tweeting about it relentlessly. I didn't see him there, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was there. God, why would you hang around Canelo? Oh, he was. Yeah, time? he was there. Eddie, he's oh. got a photo of Canelo. Canelo hugging him, uh, saying unbeatable, but you don't even work with this guy. I mean, you, you don't put the same effort with your own guys, uh, unless it's Joshua. I mean, how desperate has Eddie become now? He's like running around hula hooping Canelo that much. He's eating his paella for him or whatever they eat. <laughs> Taco Bells. Tacos, yes. Uh, you know, when you're younger and you've got like a girl, you've got a girl you like, and um, they end up with another fella, and then you end up going to the same parties and them in the hope that you can catch their eye or, you know, convince them to change their opinion. Yeah, that's that's effective. bordering on stalking that or pe- being a peeping Tom, isn't it? That Sa- is same parties, I didn't say to the same house, but same parties, yeah. yeah. So that's that's how Eddie, that's how Eddie reminds me of, you know, one of those guys that is desperate that, wants to be seen that I'm here to support you still. Yeah, and will will IFL be asking Eddie, Eddie, do you feel out of touch uh, hanging around Canelo and Eddie Reynoso like a bad smell at an Al Heyman show? 
even though you are fuck all to do with Canelo, Will Coogan and Michelle Phelps be asking them questions to Eddie Hills, the former Iceman, not. Ice man, feet by way. I mean, he's got Kid Galahad fighting in one of the worst cards I've seen in years in Sheffield um, against Kiko Martinez. That's in one week's time. Kiko He'll Martinez, have to... isn't he dead him yet? No, he's fighting against Kid Galahad somehow for a world title. I thought he died and then the, uh, Eddie, Eddie dug him up, didn't he? Pretty much, yeah. He, dug him. I mean, he, he was shot to pieces fighting Scott Quigg years ago. I mean, how's well, he's even in mix for the world title? How's he getting world title shots? He's more losses than Derek Warchizora. The war horse. Um, I mean, he's got 10 losses. The last time he fought, he lost against uh, he lost against Zelfa Barrett, didn't he? And then he Zelfa fought against... Zelfa your world title shot then. Yeah, but I think Del- he actually beat Zelfa Barrett, but they gave him the decision, but still... Yeah, Kiko it. Martinez, two losses over his last five. He must be on the same plane ticket uh, discount as Eric Molina, Lucas Brown. Pretty much. Do you know what I mean? Kiko, who else is on that show? Who's Terry Harper fighting? Let's see. Let's see who he is fighting against. Let's see who's on the card. Chris Bullum Smith against Dylan Bragon for the European title. I don't mind that fight. Terry Harper against Alicia Baumgartner, who's a good fighter or decent female fighter. Uh, James Flint against Dom Hunt. Don't know who they are. Dante Dixon against Jordan McCrory. That's an all right 5 4 5 0, but the rest is just. Raymond Chapman. James, James Flynn, that's Steffi's biggest ticket seller, traveling kid. Oh, is he? Yeah. While well, he's fighting against um, Dom Hunt for the Southern Area title. Dom Hunt. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty terrible card. Dom Hunt has fought uh, only one six rounder in his career. So here we are. Is it a is it has he got a losing record, Don Monty? Has he? No, no. no he's he um, seven and zero, but he's just fought against journeyman, as has James Flynn. Yeah, he's only fought. Yeah, they both just fought journeyman, aren't they? Yeah, guys with losing records. Yeah, pretty much. But that's that's the level Central Area is now. It's gone down a touch because there ain't that many people that can compete for it. So it's basically you can pick. Titles up left, right, and centre. I mean, Jason Cunningham picked a European up, didn't he? Mm-hmm. I mean, pandemic. So, if Jason Cunningham's picking a European up, there's hope for Spencer Fearing yet, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Your old mate, my old sparring partner. Not right, Spencer. I'll get round to you when I'm a bit better. But uh, so, if that said, is Sheffield Bonanza? Where's that at? Of Sheffield Arena, yeah, probably. They'll not Let's sell see. That out. That was ten thousand. Let's see where that is at. That is at, yeah, Sheffield Arena. You'd have thought they'd have knocked that down to Pons Ford because they'll not sell the Arena out. It'll be all comp. It'll be all oh, comp. By, t- by Teddy's, by Teddy's image, isn't it? He yeah, needs to have it in big arenas so that it can look like it's a lively event and the whole of Sheffield turns up. He'd rather pay thousands more to put it on there when really he could have contained it with a sellout at Ponds Ford, two and a half thousand, only paid maybe a quarter at site fee to put it on there. And it would have looked brilliant, packed, wouldn't it? It's set instead. Yeah, Ponds Forge is nice, nice place to if for boxing. Go to a, a arena where it's going to be empty all over the place, there's going to be loads of comps and paying out more money, but that's because of his big E. Yeah, and you know what? The camera is going to be low, so everybody watching, if make sure you watch at the camera angles, they'll be just showing the lower seats and they're going to be telling everybody from up to move down so it looks like it's packed. Yeah, that's what they do. But uh, if it, it if he'd have had his bra- any brains about him, he'd have dropped down, but it would have hurt him because he's given Dennis that much stick that uh, he won't want to be seen to be putting shows on at the same level arena as Dennis. 
Well, that's oh, the level yeah. he's at. That's the level he's at at the moment. That's the level. Like Joshua are at way, and I don't know why. That's where they're, that's where they're at now. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly right. It's uh, it's like the days when Eric Coaching was headlining in uh, Brentford Leisure Centre. That's effectively where they are. You remember him, Eric Coaching? The Eagle. Do you remember that Barry Earn said to it, he got him an OR in office. He says, "You two need to sort yourself that. You need a new image, and you to Eric and to OR." A week later, O'Hara turned up with gold hair, didn't he? Spiky, <laughs> gold, funky hair. And that other, well, that other stupid cunt were walking around in white Elvis glasses, wasn't he? And I remember, he coached, yeah. Do you remember? <laughs> and then when he took them off. And, oh, oh, you're thinking he was, thinking he was Elvis, wasn't he? <laughs> then, when he took, then when he took them off, like, I know, so it used to go, the charisma, that's the, you know... The bravado of Eric Kutcher, oh, their confidence. Um, and then he'd take them off and he'd start fighting. I remember that beefy Smith fight in Brentford Arena and Eric Kutcher just looked scared in the ring. <laughs> Eric Kutcher walking about, right, in Elvis glasses, thinking he'll have a, saying, hey, I'll have a baby shower. Uh, uh, you've got the... the... <laughs> Getting flogged by uh, Beefy Smith or whoever it was. Uh, yeah. Oh, I remember it because, and, and then I was thinking, what exactly does Barry Hearn tell these fighters <laughs> when they're going out from gym and they're going home at night and then coming back with uh, the O.R. Oh, Davis, he had an afro, dyed gold. I remember that. Do you remember that? Trying to be different. <laughs> and that was, what the one? And I've just mentioned it, but I can't get out of my head. <laughs> Walking about like fucking hell. And they also did look like Prada glasses. They look like Primark glasses. You look like, like the cheap. Out of it. Pound, pound landing, Mech Metra. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kids go and get up there, Jeremy Market. Get some sunglasses. <laughs> what, what are they on? <laughs> Tried to take that snooker mentality into boxing, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. You know, that snooker looper, do you remember it? Uh, no, but I know they were all characters. They were all Dr. characters. The reds and the screw back. Oh, my. Listen, it's not worked, has it? It didn't work for Eric Oaching, did it? And no. It looked to me like it were working for O'Hara Davis because they stuck a knife in his back, didn't they? Mm-hmm. O'Hara's yeah. a lovely kid as well. I mean, I've met it him and nice. you've met him as well. He's a nice yeah. kid. Yeah, he was taken yeah. advantage of. Hey, listen, mate, he stood up to them, didn't he? he mm-hmm. stood up to them, and that's what they need. The, the, they need standing up to them earns because if not, they're just going to run roughshod over everybody until they get their own way. They did well, it with darts. They did it with darts, you know. Darts were going long before they turned up, and they're trying to do it with snooker now, mate. They even tried to do it with football. They tried to take West Ham on, didn't they, to get a few quid? Yeah, for later Orient. It didn't work out, mate, did it? But can we quickly talk about Scott Fitzgerald? Because yeah, we I can. think that I think that's a good example of where my yeah. fighters are my family. Yeah. And we yeah, talk about first, duty of I'll... care. Pardon? You'll go first on this and then I'll yeah. be kind of Yeah. We talk about duty of care and we talk about taking care of fighters. And I know Scott Fitzgerald went to that sporting clinic, Tony Adams's thing, and you know, Eddie Hearn was saying, I think two weeks ago in an interview, Scott Fitzgerald will be fighting in 2022, or was it last week? And the next thing we see, we see him in a quite bad state, uh, some images circulating around. And, you know, it's sad to see. And I think the sad thing is that there's very little duty of care for these promoters, for boxers, and they don't really care about the fighters at the end of the day. They're all money making machines. And, this image that match rooms any difference, you know, Frank Warren might get stick about the fact that if he doesn't pay people on time and like Tony Belly always reminds us, but if you're not taking care of these people after their careers or when they fall in hard times, so what are you doing? Like any business, the primary thing is you take care of your employees. Um, you know, if you, th- if we think about the pandemic, when companies, we're sending people home and, you know, making sure they were fine. And then the companies that weren't doing that, those were the ones that got criticized in boxing. The fans allow these promoters to treat fighters like, you know, absolute crap because 
nobody's asking the questions. I mean, what's Coogan saying about, have you seen this about Scott Fitzgerald? What have you done with him? Why did he mention that he's fighting next year? Have you been in contact with him? When the phone stops ringing from Eddie, it puts people in a bad place. Look at Dave Allen, look at Scott Fitzgerald. So I think it's, um, I think as much as we talk about Matchroom and everybody else, I just think it's, that's the real stain on the sport, how little support the fighters get and how little they cared for by the people that ultimately decide their destiny. Yeah, I see where you're coming from now. They can have a taste of the good life and then if they don't look after the money or the careers and, or train when they're told to. But what happens, you get wrong people around them like Scott Fitzgerald and, and you make wrong decisions. Dave Allen's made massive, massive, bad, poor decisions for money. And he, he'll have to regret that, won't he, now? Because it looks like his 15 minutes are up, doesn't it, really? And it's a shame, mm-hmm. isn't it? But getting back to Fitzy, if I were with Dennis now, I'd be like, Dennis, what about him? Why don't you make a move to try and sign him and that? And what he would say to me is this. Do you think, Russ, that people aren't tried to put their arm around Fitzy? Because they will have done. They were world mm-hmm. round, they? 15 and old, 29-year-old. Commonwealth gold medal, should have gone to Olympics. He's basically the real deal, isn't he? He is, he is. Well, there's a dark side to Fitz, isn't there, whereas he likes to knock about with people from his area, which is part of the 12 steps. When you do the 12 steps, you've got to get away from the people that can drag you down to that level, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you've got to move area. I moved in with Michael Jennings, but he kept wanting to go back to Preston. So they couldn't help him out. Steve Woods, no doubt helped him out, been giving him a few quid here, there and everywhere, and he's probably heard every story. Book off him, honey, Steve, yeah, I'm going to soak yeah. my head out, this and that. And I, I've heard stories about hard drugs as well, really hard drugs. So if he's gone down mm-hmm. that route, if it's true, he's got a long road, and he could be a year. He could be a year out of, out of the game. Yeah, I'm not worried about him boxing again. It's more about him being fine and I think that's where yeah. you know Matchroom has all the money in the world the least they could do is to try and support him not by giving him money but you know trying to speak to Steve Wood trying to get him back into the program trying to find him accommodation away from uh, Preston you know something like that and I think that's where it's missed and I wouldn't blame Matchroom per se if they didn't want to do it and they might have tried to do it behind the scenes. But if Eddie's talking in interviews last week that Scott Fitzgerald will be out next year, does he know what this guy's doing? Does he care? Is no, he he's is he bold? He's paying lip service and he's probably thinking, hey, that's a great story. From, from, from zero to hero to zero, he'd be thinking of the storyline, well, only that fucking rat. Yeah, I think probably he'll get him to be beat, this. right? Yeah. He'll be getting him beat somewhere, won't he? Yeah, I'd be thinking I'll get I'll get you back out with Fowler or Cheeseman or some old beefy Smith, something like that. That's all they'll be thinking of, pound notes. Yeah. If, if he was such this caring gentleman, my fighters are like my family. Well, how come he's not out with Lee Purdy having a beer? Because they were family, weren't they, at one point, him and Purdy? Mm-hmm. Well, they're not now, are they? Do you know what I mean? Whatever happened to that? My fighters are like my family, look. Fighters are pound signs to him, and once them pound signs are gone, he's no good. He's an iceberg. He's an ice man, Eddie. But the immune because the, 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 the goal is money, and it's that deep ingrained in them that they're not bothered with the trample over. They're not bothered about boxing fans. If he were, there'd be no stub up, would there? No. Nope. They wouldn't be doing stuff. They wouldn't be putting pay per view up. They wouldn't be rinsing people eight hundred quid to sit and watch something in his garden. They don't care for the fans. They've got the little friends on YouTube and media. They'll let them, they'll ask them easy questions and then they put themselves out there. And all of them will want to ask proper questions and no room at the inn. It's manipulation of a sport. And do you know what? I don't want to hear you, mate. And it's, the it's all with coming the manip- out to roast now, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The problem with the manipulation of the sport is that fans aren't dumb. Most of them aren't, at least. And they see truth and that's what turns people off boxing. I mean, I've watched less boxing over the last 12 months than I've ever watched before just because there's not enough good shows. And also, why would I invest my time in something that's just the same old cycle? I mean, mm-hmm. it's a waste of time, a lot of it. 
I mean, look at yesterday's boxer card, for example. Do I need to see Mashadod on my TV? Is he still going Mashadod? Yeah, he fought yesterday in that boxer tournament. I, I know it's a tournament, but ultimately, is this the level that we're looking at, you know? Jesus, Mashadod. He fought down <laughs> and ages ago in. I know, but, you know, let's see who was in this tournament. This boxer lightweight tournament included... Um, let's see. He had Kane Gardner, Nathan Bennett, Tom Farrell, Ben Fields. I think Tom, I didn't know Tom Farrell was still fighting. Uh, Lee Appleyard, Levi Kenosa, Sean Dodd, Corey Gibbs. I mean, this is 2007, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus. Masha Dodd's still going strong. Team Masha, eh? God. Bumbaya, we, Bumbaya Masha. It would go, yeah, it'll be going longer than Kiko Martinez at Lucas Brown at this rate, won't it? Yeah, I think Masha Dodd did an interview a while ago, didn't he, where he said he was quite depressed um, recently. His wife left him, took, took the money and the kids, and, you know, the phone stopped ringing and I think that's one of the things that in boxing is always sad when you're not needed. The phone stops ringing and all these fighters think they big deals and nobody helps them with the future plans. And I mean, if I was involved in matchroom or running matchroom, the very least, you know, I'd get, bring in a financial advisor and, you know, say, or work with managers that you could set up some sort of pension or, you know, 5% of your purse goes towards something try and give them options to do training courses outside of boxing or, yeah. I mean, boxers aren't always the smartest, but still, you know, give them the options. Whereas a lot of these guys, they realize when the phone stops ringing, they've got no mates, no money, nobody around them. Oh, you know where you are? You're working on a building site for minimum wage, aren't you? Freezing your nuts off. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. your mate, Danny Connor. Yeah, like Danny Connor, walking around with monkey teeth on a building site on Skid Row. It's not good, but uh, some people hang around the sport like a bad smell, though, and others go and get a job. So I respect them that go and get a job. Yeah, I mean, so look, one... it, it, was a, it was a knock at Danny Connor. I mean, he does what he has to, to yeah. feed his family, yeah. and he's realised that his career's over, and he's doing... I think that's what all boxers should do, and I think he... In many ways, he was one of the pioneers of Matchroom when, when it started. So, you know, he's not, I met him and he's not, at least never been a bad guy to me. And I've got nothing bad to say about him. Uh, but I think it's, yeah, a lot of boxers never get the mentality that they have to leave the sport. They always think they're relevant and nobody's around them telling them, they, you know, what well, you should start thinking about what you're going to do after boxing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, too many hang around like a bad smell, like poncers, and it's a shame. But if there were more education for boxers coming through with border control, like you could put them on computer courses or you could put them on bricklaying courses or oak, couldn't you? There's oak. There's some of these yeah. things done, doesn't it? Because there's people getting out of the sport and they're walking around talking like Scooby Doo and still talking about comebacks like Glenn McCrory. Yeah, but also instead of, well, if you think about it, the promoters will pay the board for various different things to run the events. You could take some of that money, you could up that money a bit, a few percent, and you could take some of that money to create, whether it's some sort of pension fund or health fund when boxers mm -hmm. get, you know, after a career, if they've got injuries, they end up, you know, some of that will go towards insurance or some of that will go towards paying for different things. Also, people might be able to apply for like grants or things if they want to study outside of boxing uh, or learn some skills. There's lots of stuff that can be done. And I know it's been done in football and other sports, but the board doesn't care. The promoters don't care. I think some managers do care, but it's too hard to do on your own. It needs to be done at scale. Um, so... We have a problem where the promoters don't care about the fighters and actually the board doesn't care either. They're just money-making machines. Yeah, I mean, I feel for, sorry for people who, who give, give everything to the sport and they end up on scrappy. 
And then you've got other people who maybe put as much into the sport and they seem to be all over the telly because they're in right little click. Yeah, like Tony Bellew, for example. Darren Barker, people like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, all, they're all over the telly, aren't they, because they're not afraid to hula hoop people. Whereas there's other people that are not really like that. You know, your Clinton Woods, Robin Reeds, people like that. have got better CVs than Bellew and Darren Barker. But they at the top level. That I'm less worried about them. I'm worried about the guys like... In the lower levels, the oh, former you mean Br- like British. Michael Gomez, as you Dave Allen. Yeah, those like kind. Of, I mean, Dave Allen's made he's made good money, but I'm talking more the Michael Gomez level, uh, Scott Fitzgerald level, the yeah. you know Liam Cameron type level guys. That yeah. I'm not saying anybody that laces a pair of gloves and fights four fights at a small hall should be entitled to that because. If that's the case, they should be having another job, right? It's not really an income, but I'm talking more about the guys that have become that have been full time boxers and as a result have bad health, um, struggles outside of the ring, mental or physical. And then you add to that, they spend from age 15, 14 to age 30, they lifetime game punched in the head and they don't have any skills or much education. So that's where I think the board, that's where the real gap is. Less so at the bottom end, because that's up to you if you want to be a pro uh, when you fight on the small hall. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. It's, uh, it, it needs a full shake-up, doesn't it, Rico? It needs a full mm-hmm. shake-up. And uh, we're more than happy to do it on Porky's Corner via Zoom. Yeah, you need you need Simon Jordan. Uh, you need Simon Jordan to come. We need Simon Jordan to come because he's not threatened to start, stick up for himself or tell him, is he? You no, know I mean? he's not. He, he's not like Coogan Cassius who's going to go, Del Boy. You should really be a world champion. Every time you've stepped up, you've been robbed, Del Boy. Well, Simon <laughs> Jordan didn't say any of that. Any of that. This a lot, Del Boy. Every time you step up, you get beat. So you're not world level. Well, it's right, isn't it? He's European level, isn't he? British stroke European, Derek, isn't he? I mean, look, if you're European level, you better 99% of people who ever lace their gloves up and fight there professionally. Go. There's nothing nothing wrong with that, but it's not... Boy should have come out with a name. And he should have said, well, here's a name I've beat, Simon. It was world level and he couldn't, could he? He couldn't do it. Football's a weird, uh, sorry, boxing's a weird sport. Imagine in football, you have a player that plays for Southampton. Uh, let's say someone like James or Stuart Armstrong or James Ward Prowse, someone like that level. Imagine if the football media was telling them what they want to hear. You know what? You're the best midfielder in the world. You're the best player in the world. And that's what boxing media is. The boxing media is not objective in any way because they don't criticize boxers. They give them a platform to say what they want. I mean, the amount of stories that I've read where boxing journalists journalists have written stories where they allowing a boxer, sort of area-level boxer, to talk about their ambitions of becoming a world champion. And not once have they challenged them. It's like a platform where you can just say what you want. It's like me. It's like you interviewing me and say, and I'd be saying, yeah, I'm going to be a multi-billionaire in the next year. I'm going to create a rocket ship like Elon Musk and launch it to the earth. And you say, okay, okay. And you're just going to write it. I mean, that's not journalism. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, you're right, Rico. I never looked at it like that. You've got a good outlook. Oh, thank you. Uh, What have you been eating this morning, Rico? Your cereals? Uh, I had... uh... A cheese scone and a cup of tea while I was watching the Canelo cheese fight. Scone for breakfast, Rico. I'm not much of a breakfast eater. <laughs> I had to eat something quickly so I could watch the Canelo fight before coming on here. Uh, what did you think to it? Uh, you know what? He reminded me a lot of Triple G, the way how. Have you seen the fight? Yeah, I've seen it. He yeah. reminded me a lot of Triple G, the way how he was stalking plants. And I think he realized quite quickly that plant doesn't have that one punch power and he didn't have any respect for him. Um, so he was quite flat footed in the sense that he wasn't as fluid as he usually is, but he was great. His feints, And I think he knew 
after round one or two that I'm going to take this guy out. Plant didn't really have anything in his arsenal. He reminded me a bit of the Joshua Usyk fight in the sense that there was no, on that performance, there was no way that, you know, Plant could have won. That I couldn't see a way that Plant could have won unless he'd, you know, punched from the heavens. But I think Canelo was really, really impressive. And, you know, before the beefy, sorry, not beefy, Liam Smith fight, Canelo had those couple of fights where he didn't look as good, but I think that was due to going up and down the weights. Whereas, yeah, I think this was one of his better performances of his career. He was really good. That's all right. Yeah. Well, all right, should we? Yeah, I've got to go because I've got to get this changed. <laughs> all right. It was a good chat anyway. How long have we been on? Uh, right. 45 or so. All right. Well, listen, all thanks right. for coming on. Pleasure. Hope it goes well. Send my best to the family, as always. I will. Uh, All right. right. Speak to you soon, mate. Good to see you all. All right. Take care. Bye. Oops. There you go, Mr. Cordwell. Stop rubbing things out.